Hi, everyone. Um, basically, the, what I'm going to present now is um, the research that I've completed during my PhD. And I'm going to start off by looking at this continuum, which is building on what Richard's talked about, the change in dynamics of the infectious and the non-communicable diseases. And I'm look, looking into a little bit of the, some of the factors that impact on this and that have had an influence in the change. Um, and then move on to talking about the advocacy for these diseases and how it's changed over time. Um, and then specifically looking at the neglected zoonotic diseases, which is what I now focus on, um, and how, how the attention's changed over the years on those as well. Um, so this is an image from the Global Burden of Disease study from 2010. And I wanted to start with this just to kind of highlight the different changes. Maybe, probably many of you have seen this before. Like, and you can see that a lot of the inc things that have increased have been um, the non-communicable diseases. There's been a lot of decreases in infectious diseases. And this is between 1990 and 2010. Obviously, HIV has been a massive increase over those 20 years, um, which, again, like, kind of pushes back the continuum back towards the infectious diseases again. So um, this is a flow chart taken from the description of the changes that, will t that have taken place. Back from This is from the original Global Burden of Disease study that was published in 1993. Um, and at this time, it was the, f the, the um, importance of non-communicable diseases in low- and middle-income countries kind of came to light for the first time. Um, and they, they, it was described that the changes that would take place would kind of occur in two stages, and that the first stages would be this demographic transition, which would see the, the decrease in the um, infectious disease burden, which would then lead to a decrease in the fertility rates as as that pattern changed. Um, and then you would move into the epidemiological transition as the population aged, and the, that, that's what we're seeing now with the increasing non-communicable diseases in these low and middle income countries. Um, so my, my research started off looking at the dynamics just between the infectious and non-communicable, and it was the infectious diseases specifically, whereas a lot of the time they're grouped um, for de like development reasons with maternal conditions and nutritional conditions. But um, I looked just specifically at the infectious diseases and then compared the burden with the non-communicable diseases using 2004 data. Um, so this is um, the representation of this throughout the world using the World Bank regions. And basically what I wanted to highlight was that at this time in sub-Saharan Africa was the only region in which there was more infectious diseases than non-communicable diseases. Um, and rather than talking about it all the time as um, two separate numbers, I then started to look at it as a unit rate. So um, it was the infectious diseases divided by the non-communicable diseases. So you had like one number to represent this. And this is um, globally, um, ref this shows that. So the blue colors are countries in which there's the, the unit rate is greater than one. So there's more infectious diseases than um, non-communicable diseases. And again, you can see that it's only in African countries that this happens. Um, and the, this is for DALIs and also um, for mortality. But you can see how it's shifted, that for mortality, there's less blue countries. More countries have more in a greater number of deaths for non-communicable diseases than infectious diseases. And this is just um, due to the way that the the measures, um, DALI's kind of skews it towards infectious diseases just because um, it takes into account the years of life loss, so premature mortality, and obviously taking then into account childhood deaths from infectious diseases and everything. But again, you, th the point to make is that it's mainly sub-Saharan Africa that's experiencing more infectious diseases. But as it changes there, it's this dual burden of disease that we're thinking about that as the, as Richard said, like as the burden of non-communicable diseases increases, like how do we deal with that and how do we adapt to be able to deal with both things? Um, so, so these are the factors, some of the factors that I looked at and how they correlated to the unit rate to see which ones had like a, a bigger influence on the change than others. Um, and beginning with the reducing incidence of infectious disease, obviously this is going to impact on the unit rate because you're changing one of the numbers that you're calculating with. Um, but mainly, I just like discussing the big three um, that you would obviously, as we've increased the um, availability of antiretrovirals, um, HIV deaths are decreasing, and we're managing that um, 
managing the disease um, much, uh, and there's much more access to the medicines and everything. Um, tuberculosis is kind of a bit slower because of the um, impl influence of HIV on this in people's um, reduced the co-infection with HIV, but malaria as well has decreased, and we've seen a reduction in the number of cases of malaria over the last couple of decades. Um, childhood diseases as well, we've made massive strides with the Millennium Development Goals in reducing <coughs> childhood deaths from diarrheal disease and um, infectious diseases, and uh, also water and sanitation has a big part to play in that as well. Um, so to look at the next factor was the total disease burden for all causes. And you can see that the correlation is a strong correlation that as you, um, as you decrease the total burden of disease, the, the non-communicable diseases start to make up a bigger proportion of it. So it's basically infectious diseases reducing that is having the impact on that. Um, and that, so then this is kind of going back to the flow chart I showed earlier, how the fertility is one of the first stages of that transition. Um, this is a map showing the, um, the global fertility rates um, as a, the live births per woman. Um, and the, it's kind of categorized as high fertility rates would be more than five um, births per woman. And this is, I think it's something like 27 countries at this time in sub-Saharan Africa of the 46 countries had high fertility rates. Um, and the, it's... The, 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 reduction in, um, the, the reduction in infectious diseases leading to the reduction in fertility rates kind of is a 40-year lag, and it was, um, so we're kind of seeing the start of that impact on sub-Saharan Africa now. Um, it's, it, we're the start, like at the end of the lag, if you like. Um, and it's also linked to urbanization. As people move into cities, it's more expensive to have more children. There's less... Um, there's lots of different, like, there's lot, obviously lots of factors. It's not as simple as just, and so yeah. If we move on to then childhood mortality, um, the d number of deaths um, of children under five per 1,000 live deaths. Again, we can see that it's much higher in sub Saharan Africa than it is around the world. Um, and again, it's correlated to the unit rate. As the unit rate decreases, um, the number of childhood deaths decreases, and there's a strong correlation between that as well. Um, the next factor is life expectancy, and with this one, it's obviously, as, as life expectancy increases, the, the, percent, the proportion of disease burden that's made up of non-communicable diseases increases, and this is, again, going back, uh, as you live longer, you accumulate more diseases, and there's more non-communicable diseases as you, with aging. Um, population growth isn't isn't as strongly correlated. Um, it's basically as we um, look at the, as life expectancy increases and the, then the population grows, there's um, a correlation then between, for every 1% increase in life expectancy you see, there's about a 1.5% increase in the t um, population size. So this also has an impact on the, is correlated to the unit rate. Economic status as well, um, these are kind of, it's a cycle with this one because as you increase the health of the population and, the d um, and reduce the infectious diseases and the morbidity that way, um, the economic status of the country increases and as you increase the economic status then people become healthier because there's more access to healthcare and everything like that. Um, <laughs> urbanization again is linked as you move into cities, you increase the um, proportion of non-communicable diseases in the total disease burden um, and this is linked with obviously a massive range of risk factors, um, the increased exposure to processed foods, less exercise, um, a whole variety of factors which, um, which would influence this. Um, but then just to point out as well that I looked as well at the size of cities and the, the number of, the proportion of the population that lives in cities where there's more than a million people. <coughs> And this wasn't as strongly linked with the unit rate, so I don't think it, it doesn't matter how big the city is, um, the impact is, it happens in, with urban populations. And nutri nutrition and obesity, um, I looked at obesity levels for sub-Saharan Africa and looked at the, um, basically 
if you're using obesity as an early indicator of the rising incidence of non-communicable diseases, and you see that there's a much higher rate of obesity in urban centres than there is in rural centres, um, again, it's linked to this risk, these risk factors, and that as an indicator, like pointing to the fact that non-communicable diseases in these places is increasing, just again, like clarifying that a bit further. So then if I move on to the advocacy, this was the second part of my research, which I looked at um, all of the resolutions that had been adopted at the World Health Organization, um, the assembly of that which takes place every year. And the idea behind this was that the resolutions are member state driven, and so it's a kind of indication of the global, um, globally what the priorities are within global health. And um, over the whole, um, between 1948 and 2013, there was um, 484 resolutions which I included as either being in indicating infectious or non-communicable diseases, or there was 17 that were for both. Um, and this was then, so it makes up 77% uh, of, of all of the resolutions that have been adopted were for infectious diseases, and 23% were for non-communicable diseases. Um, and this slide shows it decade on decade, the change. And we can see that it is that we are becoming more concerned with uh, non-communicable diseases. <coughs> and I appreciate that in the, ho the concept of international health and global health developed as a, a, a means to try and stop the spread of the communicable diseases between countries. So it makes sense that that was within the remit of WHO mm. when it started. Um, so it makes sense that the focus is on infectious diseases. Um, and most of the emergency resolutions that come through, it's with epidemics, and so there's always going to be a, a much more of a, I don't want to say panic, but infectious diseases are a much faster reaction um, than non-communicable diseases. But just to highlight that we are changing how we concentrate on that. Um, I won't focus on this too much because there's quite a lot of information in this slide, but this was, um, again, I've picked out um, significant um, things to look at through time, and you can see that for Smallpox, there was there's obviously, as you build up to the eradication, there was resolution every year, and there was push to push and to maintain the focus to eradicate the disease. Um, whereas you can see there's much less for the um, main non-communicable diseases. Um, so now I'd move on to the neglected zoonotic diseases. And I've um, focused on these eight um, main neglected zoonotic diseases um, for this research as well. Um, th these diseases are classed as neglected um, as they primarily affect populations where um, rural populations where there's a high reliance on livestock and the close proximity to the animals. Um, they're endemic, so they don't have that kind of panic factor of uh, outbreaks. Um, they're underestimated as a burden, so we don't actually appreciate fully how much impact they have on populations. And they require um, a collaboration between the uh, doctors and vets and, and at higher levels between the ministries of agriculture and um, health. Then it's much, it makes it much more complicated to control these diseases and it's much um, less defined who, where the responsibility lies. <coughs> um, so for all of the eight diseases, um, these are all of the resolutions that were identified as being focused on them. And the main thing to point out is like the sporadic nature of it, that they, it's uh, very inconsistent. And so, for example, rabies was defined in the beginning, the first 10 years of the WHO, it was a priority disease, and it was described as one of the most dreaded diseases of, of humans, um, just obviously due to the nature of the disease itself. And you can see that there's, um, since 1951, there hasn't been a single resolution adopted on rabies. And it, it, it's kind of fallen off the map a little bit, and we've, we've lost the focus on that. The same with brucellosis, it was described as a priority, uh, priority veterinary disease in the first decade of the WHO, but from that first year, there hasn't been another resolution adopted. Um, last year, there was a resolution adopted for all 17 neglected tropical diseases, and five of these diseases are included in that. And there is a focus on this on veterinary public health. It's one of the five um, main um, interventions that are indicated for control of neglected tropical diseases. Um, but there is, it's still lacking for, for anthrax, brucellosis, and um, bovine tuberculosis. These are left still off the map. And this slide is just to kind of highlight the sporadic nature of it compared to HIV. And obviously, um, 
HIV is a very is very important. I'm not saying that you know that it's not, but that you can see that since the first year that HIV was um, discussed at the assembly, there's been a resolution almost every single year. Um, but then these diseases that were described as priority diseases for the WHO when it began, they then they just they meant get mentioned once and then never again. Um, so it's just to kind of highlight that sporadic nature of that. Um, the NTD resolution has been described as a historic step in the road to controlling these diseases. Um, and like I said, zoonotic diseases are implicated in this, and it, which is a massive positive step towards controlling them. Um, there is a worry that because there's a huge focus on preventive chemotherapy and mass drug administration that some of these diseases, they don't fall into that. And that's kind of the problem that they, they're hard to control and that they d there's not one common intervention that can be applied to all of them. And that, like I said, it's lacking for three of these major neglected zoonotic diseases that we can control in developed countries. That's, you know, brucellosis and bovine TB aren't an issue in the UK anymore. Um, and anthrax seen, it's more we worry about it as bioterrorism, but it is endemic in a lot of countries still. So it's just something that needs to be kind of raised. Um, so just to conclude the whole thing, um, we obviously know that the burden of disease is changing and there are lots of factors that can be implicated in this and that, that influence it. Um, and the advocacy at global health level is still weighted towards infectious diseases and it probably is never going to not be weighted completely towards infectious diseases because, like I said, you need emergency responses to these diseases. The NCDs have des been described as a slow motion catastrophe. They're much like it's like a slow burning flame, I guess. And we're only now realizing the true burden of these diseases in a lot of places. Um, and it's kind of the same with the neglected zoonotic diseases that they're endemic. They've remained in these rural populations for a long time, and that we it, we we really don't know the true burden of them. So. Um, that's something that needs to be thought about. So, yeah, right, thank you all.